Morning, everybody. Brother Raj is, is home. He's got some, uh, got some bronchitis, and they, with his compromised lung and, and a couple other things he's dealing with, they thought he'd better just stay home. So he's quarantining, not because of COVID, but because of bronchitis. So he's got bronchitis he's taken care of, so he's taking the, taking the week off. So keep your prayers, keep uh, Raj in your prayers. All right, for announcements this morning. Uh, the first announcement we have, that we're going to have a congregational meeting next week. This is actually one we were going to have back in March, but because of everything that happened. So we're kind of, uh, we're kind of going back to kind of make things right in our minutes and, and all those things. But we're going to have a con- congregational meeting Sunday right after the service. And, and what we're going to do is, for people who are not able to attend, I will send out a Zoom invitation uh, probably Saturday of next week so that you can participate at home and make your voice heard and the invitation will be for probably about 12.05, and we'll have the meeting at 12.05. We'll be able to put you up here on the screen, and we'll be able to see you. So uh, that's how our, we will be able to count everybody's vote. for. And we're going to be doing this to actually officially elect and put in place the nominations committee. And I know they they met way back a few months ago and, and have some things, but w- to make everything official, we need to have this congregational meeting. So that's next Sunday right after the service. All right. Uh, coming up September 13th, it's just a few weeks away is uh, we're going to have the vertical marriage on Sunday evenings. And so far we've got, what they say, about seven or eight people that have responded, seven or eight couples. Every, okay, well, I know Allie said on Facebook there are some people that are interested at least. So hopefully there will be, be more people coming. So if you know, anybody, know anybody that's interested, uh, there's the websites down there to point them to. Uh, youth group did not meet less last week because of Roger's uh, illness, but uh, he's hoping to pick back up again this Wednesday. And we're still continuing through Max Lucado's You'll Get Through This study on Wednesdays. And the Fall Women's Retreat, I misprinted it here in the, in the bulletin. It's actually, uh, it's been canceled for the fall, but they're going to do it back in the spring, in April 30th, May 1st and 2nd. So that's the new dates for that. Do we have other announcements we need to make at this time? Anybody got anything else that we need to lift up? If not, let's just open up with prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for gathering us here this morning uh, to allow us to worship together. And Lord, we just pray that our time together would be worshipful and would be glorifying and honoring to you and lifting you up for all the world to see. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Now let's stand together and join in our call to worship. God is our refuge and strength, our help in times of trouble. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Is ready to 
You may be seated. This is the time we come together and lift our prayers, our joys, and our concerns to the Lord. So I'll open us up and then give time for you to lift up those things that are pressed upon your heart this morning. But let's go to God in prayer. Gracious Father, we come to you this morning to worship, to praise your holy name, to hear your word spoken unto our hearts. But Lord, as we come to the altar this morning, we also have many concerns that are on our hearts. We even have some joys and some, some praises for you. So Lord, as we prepare to enter into a deeper time of worship, Lord, we just ask that you would take these burdens, these concerns, these things from our hearts, and that they would be lifted up to you. So Lord, we just ask that you would hear the prayers of your people at this time. Moody family. Lord, we thank you for the gift of worshiping together, whether we're doing it in person or online. Lord, we also thank you so much for a time in our busy weeks to come together and pray together, to lift up those people, those places, those situations, those events, those circumstances in our lives that need your healing touch, that need to be praised because of your glory. Lord, we just... Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who makes all this possible. So, Lord, as we close out our prayer time, we want to pray the prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
As we prepare to hear the word of God, let's go to God in prayer. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your precious gift to us, which is your holy word. Lord, you passed down your holy word throughout history through the prophets and through the spoken word of our ancient ancestors. And Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit, you inspired men to write the holy scriptures. We thank you that we can open our Bibles, and see your holy word in written form. Lord, we thank you even more so that we can look to the life of Jesus Christ and see the written word lived out as a person. We want to thank you for that beautiful gift. So Lord, as we prepare to hear your word today, we would ask that both the written word and the word we know as Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit would come and penetrate our lives, and that we could leave this place better than when we came in, and ready to take the gospel to all who would hear. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, last week we talked about the nature of spiritual warfare, and we talked about all the different things that we can expect from the devil, how he fights his battles, and what things he uses to distract us. And I told you that this week we kind of conclude it all, and I, I realize that spiritual warfare is something I could probably preach on for about three to six months and never be done. But I just thought in, in light of what's going on in the world, we need to know. We need to know that the spiritual warfare and spiritual battles are real. I know we can probably all feel it. And today I want to talk about how we fight our battles against them. In other words, what weapons do we use in our warfare? And, and it's interesting because when we talk about weapons, of course, first thing that comes to mind is we might think of brass knuckles or a knife or a gun or something like that. But it's a completely different type of warfare. And let me just start off by giving you a little illustration. This is a dream I had um, shortly after a good friend of mine returned back from the Iraq War. He was really struggling with anger management, and, and we had before he before he had gone, we had made huge strides, and he had come to faith. But coming back, he really had a difficult time after seeing what what went on over there and how that man treated his own nation, how he treated his own army, and, and just the ravages of war. He was really struggling on how to fit back into this society. He was really struggling even in his faith. And I remember having a, a discussion about spiritual warfare. And, and I didn't really know how to relate it to him in, in, in the right way because he was still in, in battle mode from being in battles of this world. And I had a dream that night, which I actually shared with him in, in the midst of this conversation. I shared with him uh, a couple days later. And the dream was he and I were standing up on this hill. It was actually in the desert, and we, we could see this huge wall of something coming towards us. It was like a black cloud, and it was kind of taking up the horizon. And as it was coming across this, this desert, and we're standing on this hill, I could see him. He was getting his knives ready, and he was getting his guns out, and he was getting all his hand grenades ready, and he was strapping on all this stuff. And he says, we're going to fight this, right? And I said, yeah, we're going to fight this. And as it, as it came, it just kept getting bigger and bigger. And... Uh, so he starts loading up his guns, getting, getting everything ready, and he keeps looking at me. He's like, what are you doing? I said, we're getting ready to fight. And I said, but, but I, said, I told him in the stream, I said, do exactly what I tell you. He's like, okay. So as it, it, it gets to the point where as this thing approaches, the wind picks up and the, the sand is swirling all around us, and it, it just becomes this dark cloud that takes up all of everything that we can see from, from one side of of the horizon to the other. It gets to be this giant wall, and we, we realize we see it's, it just looks like a bunch of bats, and it's really demons, and it was a picture of what spiritual warfare was like. And it was coming over like a big wave, getting ready to overwhelm us, and just as it was about to hit us, 
I turned to him and I said, drop your guns and we're going to do it in just a second. He looked at me like, are you crazy? He, so he, I said, just do it. I said, drop your guns. And just as everything was about ready to crash down on us, I said, now. And the next thing I knew, we were both on our knees and we were praying to the Lord. And as soon as we hit our knees and prayed to the Lord, this light came and just split that wall of darkness and made him completely disappear. And for me, that has always stuck in my mind of an incredible vision of what spiritual warfare is like. It's not with guns, it's not with knives. That's what this world wants us to think, right? I mean, we only have to look across our nation. And we're fighting over kind of petty things with guns and knives. Just yesterday, I think the Proud Boys and Antifa had another brawl out in Seattle with baseball bats. They're destroying themselves and each other. But this is not the battles that we fight. These, it's not the way we as Christians fight the spiritual battles. Yes, people get used and abused with each other and it, it causes wars in this world. But we have to understand that our battles are from above. So I want to kind of pick up and kind of, kind of go back and and review a little bit of what, where we ended up last week. We, remember, I, I ended up reading James chapter 4 and 1 Peter 5. And the, the scripture that I want to talk about is, is basically, how do we fight our battles is, is the first piece of this. How do we fight spiritual warfare? James 4 verse 7 says it very succinctly. It says, submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? Now, why is it so hard? And I thought, and when I got to thinking about that, I said, that's exactly what that picture was all about. It wasn't about taking the fight back to the devil. I mean, my buddy, he, well, he did what he knew. In, in, in the dream, he was picking up his, his AR-15. He's, he's ready to go at it. He was going to take out as many as he could. But the only thing that, that caused it to disappear is when we submitted to God on our knees and we resisted, resisted the devil by praying to the Lord for help. So, the two pieces of this verse that I want to talk about is submit to God is the first piece. The second one is resist the devil. So what does he mean by submit to God? Well, if you look up the meaning of the word, it means to be obedient to, to trust in God, to give your life over to him. So when we submit to God, we have to basically take what we understand, what we think to be true, we have to submit it to God's word. Wouldn't the news and social media and all this junk that's out there look a little bit different if we submitted everything to the Word of God? All the conspiracy theory, theories from all these different sides. All the terrible rhetoric we hear people screaming back and forth at each other. If we submitted it to God's Word, it all just kind of falls away, doesn't it? It kind of looks like, well, okay, we're kind of falling in Satan's traps. Satan's, I, it was interesting when... When I, I saw some of these things unfolding on TV, I told Cindy, I, as, as people were falling into these traps, and we saw, it was actually a picture of something that happened, I believe, somewhere close locally. I, don't, I can't remember if it was North Georgia or somewhere here, but there were protests outside of a church because people were coming to church, and there were protesters outside saying, wear your mask, you're not listening, you blah, 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 and it, it, it almost got into fisticuffs. And I turned to Cindy, and I went, snap. And she goes, what do you mean, snap? I said, that's the mouse trap. I said, that church and those people just fell right into Satan's trap and snap, and got them. Because it, all became, it wasn't anything about worshiping God anymore. It was all about that argument, whether we should be worshiping, whether we shouldn't be worshiping, snap. And the whole distraction away from it. And of course, it's gotten even worse out in California and Nevada and places like that. But we have to submit our understanding of what's going on to the Word of God. And I think a lot of things that we think to be true here will fall by the wayside. We also have to submit our will to his will. We're going to get to that in a minute because pride is a huge thing. And I'm going to spend some time in it here in, a little, in another verse or two talking about pride. Because if we submit our will to his, which is not being done a whole lot, not even in churches a whole lot anymore. You remember when I told you a couple weeks ago that 30% that of Christians that are practicing Christians said that 30% of them are not attending church anymore? And of the ones that are attending church, 40% of them admit, well, maybe it's once a month and I'm not going to my church. I'm either shopping around or I'm hopping around on the internet because it's just easier that way. And then in a, a couple, about two months ago, I read another report from Barna that said about 36% of people who are proclaimed Christians that are church-going people say that they're not 
engaging in the Word of God like they used to from COVID-19, from the beginning of COVID-19. So it's kind of having the opposite effect of what it should have had. Remember at the beginning of this, we were hoping and praying this would be a revival. It seems like the, the people of God don't have the stomach for spiritual warfare. They're just giving up. It's not going. It's easier to sit at home. But we have to submit our wills to his. Don't do what's just easiest for us, but ask God, what do you want to do with us to do that? And the second half of James is exactly what God wants us to do. He says, resist the devil. In other words, stand against and oppose him. You notice he didn't say attack him. He said resist him. That's a very important lesson to learn, folks. I learned that early on in my ministry when I thought I was seeing demons everywhere and I was going to go on holy warfare for God. And one of my very good friends from the Pentecostal side of things who's been a pastor for over 40 years said, son, you better be careful. because Satan would love nothing more than to involve you in a fight. He'll fight with you all day long because if you're fighting with him and you're seeing demons everywhere, you're not paying attention to Jesus Christ and you're not paying attention to God. That's why we're supposed to resist him. And we resist him by those stories like I told you about when Nehemiah was building the wall. We resist him by not giving up on the work of God. And that's what saddens me right now. I see a lot of the church doing right now. A lot of my brothers and sisters in the ministry are, are considering quitting because of some of the things they're facing in the church, some of the fights that are going on in church. Some of the, the help, hopelessness and helplessness that they feel, and I, I can relate to it a little bit. I thank God that I've got a church like I do that supports me. I can't imagine being in a church where there's fisticuffs going on whether we should worship or not or where you're being bullied by elders who think this should be going on or that going on those are stories that I see on on Facebook amongst fellow pastors we need to resist him instead of fa falling into those traps that's exactly what they want us to do whenever you talk about they when you talk about they want us to fall in fear it's all you can trace it all back to one guy and his name is Satan he loves that because he wants, us to, he wants to convince us to oppose God's will. Remember last week when I talked about from the very beginning, what did he do? He told Eve, did God really say that? And when she said, yes, he did, he really did say that. He goes, well, he just really doesn't want you to have the knowledge. So see, he wants to introduce that doubt. He wants to introduce, he just wants us to oppose God's will. He wants us to see God as that restrictive force in life. That's a, that's a great argument that a lot of people, well, I don't, I don't want to believe in a God that has this set of rules or that set of rules, all right? The Bible is just this big set of rules that just makes life not much fun. It's exactly what Satan wants us to believe. But if we believe that God is a loving God and that he, he wants the best for us, wouldn't we want to follow the rules that he set out for us, knowing that if we follow those rules, not out of blind obedience and not out of just because God said so, but because we know he loves us and he put them in place for our good. So by resisting the devil, we have to say, no, God is not a hindrance to our personal preferences. My personal preferences usually come from a fallen nature and they're going to do harm to me, so I need God in my life. Well, let's move on a little bit. The, the next scripture I want to talk about is 1 Peter 5, 6 through 9. And it says this, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be of sober spirit. Be on alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. So we've got kind of a list here of ways to fight, to fight our battles against Satan. First, what do you think is first and foremost? Did you catch it right there? The second word in that scripture is humble yourselves. For us to be humble, we need to be honest with ourselves. We need to be able to take time out. We need to be contemplative. We need to look in that mirror and say, okay, what are the things that I'm doing or not doing, Lord, that would cause you to grieve? We need to be willing to confess our sins, confess our sins to God. We need to be willing to confess our sins to one another. Once again, we need to be able to be 
humble enough to submit to his will, to say, not my will, but yours, Lord. And the big one here for us in the United States is we've got to drop our ego. This ain't about us. Scott will know who I'm talking about when I talk about Jim Rogers, Methodist pastor. He'd always tell people, he had a big sign when he walked into his, his office for counseling. He said, first thing I want to tell you, get over yourself. It ain't about you. This isn't, Christianity's not about us. It's about Jesus Christ. We get to be a part of it, but we're supposed to be pointing to him, not to ourselves. And too many people, Christianity, I think that's why Christianity is suffering right now, because Christianity has become, in this country, something It's all about me. Where do I go to where I get to feel the best about myself? Or where does it feed me? Where do I like the music better? Do I like the preaching better? Do I like the atmosphere better? When you have to, when you're starting all of your sentences with me and I really need to drop our egos. It's not about us, folks. I saw this on one of the commentators that was commenting about this verse. He said, humility is the preserver of peace where pride is the disturber of it. I love this comment because I thought this has been, this next comment is about, I think can talk about every generation about the younger and older generation. He said this, pride keeps older people from trying to understand the younger people. And now all the younger people are saying, yes, exactly, but wait, there's a second piece of this. It says the younger, and it also keeps the younger people from listening to the older people. That's pride. Pride demands, I want it my way. In contrast, humility puts the other person first. Instead of saying, Lord, I want it my way, it's, Lord, I want it your way. Tell me what your way is. In fact, God has a lot to say about pride. It's interesting that the middle letter in pride and the middle letter in sin is I. And he even says in the verse previous, if we backed up one verse from what I just read, if we look at 1 Peter 5, 5, he said that God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now I ask you, if you want everything your way, you realize you might be standing against God. He might be opposing you. But he's willing to give grace and humility if you humble yourself before him. And you can look in, James actually repeats this exact same verse saying that God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. Oh, what our world would look like if we had a lot more humble people in it, right? I think it starts with that person that looks back in the mirror, at least I know for me. That person looks back in the mirror every morning and needs to take some doses of humility every once in a while. The beautiful thing about this is, why does he want us to be humble? It says, the second half of that verse says, therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Why? So that he may exalt you in the proper time. When I put those two together this morning as I was kind of putting the finishing touches on this, I thought, well, I've never thought about that. God looks at each one of you and says, I want to exalt you. When you come through the pearly gates, I want to say, there he is. There she is, my beautiful daughter, my beautiful son of God. But we have to be humble and submit to him for that because that's what he wants to do. Because if we're humble and submit to his will, that gives us salvation through Jesus Christ. All right, let's move on through to to the next piece of this. The next piece, he says, cast your anxiety on him. So first we have to humble ourselves. Then he says, cast your anxiety on the Lord. He wants us to tell him our fears. And I know a lot of times we say, well, God already knows my heart, but he wants you to admit it. It's more about about letting those things go to him. He wants you to hand them over to Jesus. Jesus has already been to every place that you could possibly go to. He's been betrayed. He's been beaten. He's He's been killed unjustly. It all goes back because, because it says in the second half of that, because he cares for you. You see, God doesn't want us to be overcome with the fear and lose hope in Jesus Christ. And fear is a hot commodity right now. Satan's really having a field day right now in our world and our country. 
And that doesn't mean we act irresponsibly towards one another, but we don't, we don't back down from it either. To give you the, the context of, of why I said God doesn't want us to be overcome by fear, because if you go back and realize, First Peter is he's sending this letter to friends of his that are going su- through some severe persecution in the church. So they know what it's like. They're living in a society that is pressing down upon them. They weren't in a place where they had free reign to go wherever they want. They're still living underneath Roman rule and Jewish leadership that's still probably hunting down disciples. It hasn't gotten much better. In fact, it got worse. If you know what the disciples went through, every one of them was killed and tortured in some way, whether it was through beatings, whether it's through exile. He says, in the midst of all this, I don't want you to be overcome by the fear of the situation. But live in the hope of your Lord. The next piece of it he talks about is be sober. Do not fall for folly. In, in other words, resist temptations. Don't get drunk on anything. That doesn't mean, okay, well, I don't have to drink, so then I'm good on that one. It's not what he's just meaning. We can get, we can get drunk on a lot of things. We can get drunk on our own power. We can get drunk on money, with sports. I don't think it's coincidental that God, I, can't, I, I feel that God is using the situation where he's taking down a lot of things that were normal in our society that are no longer there anymore. Professional sports, college sports, some of the things we were doing in our churches we can't do anymore. I think he's trying to say, look, you need to get back to what's the most important thing. Don't get drunk on anything. In the next two months, the media and the political party is going to get drunk on the elections. They're going to say all kinds of crazy things, right? We all know that. We all know that 90% of what they're going to say now, they're not going to accomplish. I see you. You'll probably be at the door next week. So. But we shouldn't. We as Christians should be sober against that kind of stuff. Not, don't fall for all the conspiracy theories and the lies and the rumors that they, I mean we know what's coming so don't fall for it be something different than what you see out there that's what God is asking he knows this stuff's gonna it's gonna go up and down throughout history it's it's gone this way there's been times that have been much worse than this there's been times that have been much better but he looks for his people to be the ones that are different and show the world that we can be different in the midst of all of this it doesn't mean that we can necessarily stop it from happening, but we can provide people hope in a way out from underneath it. It may take time. He also says after being sober, be alert. In other words, be awake, be watching. Don't just sit back. Don't be one of those 30% percent say, I don't want to go to church anymore just because ah, I just don't want to. It's easy to stay at home. I can tell everybody I'm watching on TV. I clicked on it. Don't be one of those that's just going to well, it doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't affect my life, so he's saying be alert. Satan wants you to think that he's not worried about you. So if you go off and do nothing, he doesn't have to worry about you, right? I had a, a wise pastor tell me one time, he said, if you're not facing spiritual battle in your church, you're probably not doing something right. You're probably not preaching the word hard enough, preaching the truth. Because when you do that, and you get a church full of people that believe in the Word of God and believe the truth, that makes Satan mad. And he will come and come after you. Now, that doesn't mean I want all kinds of things stirred up in this church. That's not what I'm saying. (laughs) It's not what I'm saying at all. To be honest with you, this is the most unified church I've served yet. And I'm absolutely reveling in it. But we, we can't ever fall back on our laurels and, and just let our guard down because that's when, that's when he comes. I think the second part of being alert is we have to know the devil's ta- tactics. And, and I talked about that last week. If you understand the nature of spiritual warfare, where he's going to come, what kind of things he does, knowing that he's going to lie, cheat, and steal, knowing that he's going to use smoke and mirrors all the time, know that he's trying to make you look this way when you should be looking this way, know that he's trying to take your eyes off this, if you know those tactics, then the way to resist him is don't take your eyes off this. Don't look that way when you should be looking this way. 
And it means to be alert, we need to watch out for one another, especially in this time. God may be using this to sift out the church. There's a whole lot of people that aren't coming anymore. We've got pastors that are losing heart, quitting. It's not a time to be weak need in our faith. No matter what happens, we need to care for one another. And again, he repeats, resist the devil. In other words, don't fall for his tricks and lies. We need to stand against what Satan's doing in this world. He says we need to be firm. And to be firm in our faith, we need to know our faith. We need to stand strong in it. You need to be assured of your own faith. If you're not, read and study. Meditate on God's word. Talk to friends and family and find somebody. If you're out there, find somebody who's more mature in the faith and learn about the word and ask, pray to God for wisdom and understanding. And if you've you've got a strong faith, be resolute. And as Raj told me the other week, he says, be stubborn in your faith. Don't give it up for anybody or anything. And the last thing he finishes off with in this little piece of scripture that we picked out today is he says, know that you're not alone. Satan loves to make you think you're the only one going through this right now. Yes, other people have gone through it, but you're only going through this specific thing because you're the worst person in the world, and that's why you're going through this. That's what Satan wants you to do. Peter's saying, you're not suffering alone. You know, we complain a little bit because we've got people that are protesting and maybe at our front door, but we've got brothers and sisters that live in foreign countries that get dragged out of their churches and killed on the front steps because they're worshiping. There's a lot of nations in Africa, a lot of states in Africa that are that way. We know China has been shutting down churches left and right. They're even going into people's homes now and telling them they have to tear down their crosses off the walls and put a picture of the minister up there or else. And unfortunately, we don't know exactly what else, but our minds can kind of, because they have a tendency to disappear and not be heard from ever again. There are brothers and sisters who have been suffering for the sake of Christ since the beginning. We are not alone in this. That means you need to call on friends and family. Call on your believing friends, your believing family. Maybe you need to be the light and the witness to them. Call on your Christian family. Most of all, call on Jesus who suffered and died for all of us. So that's kind of the how. These are I could go on and on with this for a long time, but I want to give you a, a, a good basic outline so you know because this, we know from what's going on out there what it's like. So you might be saying, okay, Pastor, I know how to fight now. You've given me some outlines. It sounds completely different than warfare that we think of. But what do we fight with? Well, once again, the Word of God provides that for us. This comes from Ephesians 6, 12 through 18. You've probably heard this a lot lately, from me at least. Starts off, says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now here comes our weapons. Therefore, take up the full armor of God, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything, stand firm. Hmm, there's a pattern there, isn't it? Resist and stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with the truth. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of spirit, which is the word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. I want to go through each one of these pieces of the armor of God. Probably the the best way for us to think about the armor of God is to think about, of course, if we put ourselves back in their context, you think of the Roman soldiers. You think about their breastplates and the armor and everything. And one of the things that's really interesting about this, and I've heard every decent commentator talk about that, if you notice the armor that was made back then, a lot of it was all offensive or defensive in nature, I should say. 
it, it means that you always should be facing your enemy. I've always thought it was kind of weird, even looking in some of those movies, when the Roman soldier turns around, well, you can get him in the back. There's nothing getting the his back of his legs. You could hamstring him. You could get him from behind. It, you know, it's just the back piece is just holding on the front piece. That's the armor piece of it. Everything's kind of in front. So in other words, when Satan comes at us, it doesn't mean we turn and run, but we stand against him and face him. So he starts off by saying, stand firm and resist. It sounds familiar, right? We've already talked about those, how to resist the devil, how to stand firm. But then he adds, take up your armor. In other words, be ready to direct ourselves against Satan when he comes against us. And they're weapons that God provides for us. That's the most important thing to remember, folks. It's not things that we do. It's what God provides for us. So what are the pieces of the armor of God? Well, first off, he talks about truth. And he, he kind of cut puts this in a, an interesting phrase, is gird your loins with truth. It's funny, a funny story was our, one of my professors in seminary used to say before, a te- as he's getting ready to hand out a test, he's walk around, he says, gird your loins. <laughs> and one time we said, what does that exactly mean? He said, well, in the Old Testament, if you remember when he was telling them to get ready to leave or Egypt, he told them to take up their garments, wrap them around their waist, that's girding their loins. They, they wore long things to protect them from the sand. They, you know, even the men wore kind of robes. But you can't run very easily in a robe, can you? Women, you can't run in a long dress. If, guys, if you've ever worn any kind of a robe, it's not easy to run. So if you're going to be prepared to move and do a lot of it, you need to pull it up so your legs are free to move. So that's what gird your loins means. So God wants us to gird our loins with truth. This is, it, it's, it's no coincidence that this is the very first thing he wants us to do. We have to be girded with the truth. We have to be prepared, ready to move. Truth is the first weapon. You catch this from how this overlaps with the other things? We have to know the truth. That way the lies won't be able to penetrate us. You've heard me use that example many times where the guy walks into the treasury and he's seeing these people putting these dollar bills and he sees people restoring them. He walks up to one guy and he sees all these bills sitting down. He goes, what are you, what are you doing here? He says, well, I'm, I'm here to pick out the counterfeits. He says, how do you do that? He says, I don't memorize counterfeits. He said, they're so good. There's so many of them out there. There's no way I could ever be able to catch them all. He said, but if I study the original and what it's supposed to look like and know it so well, I can pick out a counterfeit just like that. That's why we need to know the word of God. There is a lot of counterfeit being put out there. There's a lot of contradiction against Scripture right now. It, even just this last week, uh, uh, two of my brothers up in, in Saudi Daisy for a couple of Baptist churches up there said that, be careful because the, well, I can't remember what they're called, but these, uh, this group of, it's all about reason, had posted these things on the doors of churches. And in three steps, they supposedly tear down Christianity. They said, why do you worship a God that acts like a three-year-old? A lot of wrong assumptions there that they take, but they, in three steps, basically say, see, you're, you're worshiping a God that's immoral and acts like a three-year-old because you don't follow his rules, he'll punish you. Thinking, wow, they got to really compete. Anyway, that's beside the point, but there's a lot of in-truth that's, that's running around out there. We've got to know the truth. And as I read through that, I said, well, this is easy to blow apart in the first statement because you know what the truth is. Truth is our first weapon because it contradicts and disproves the lies of Satan. But the other piece of that truth, our truth and our faith need to be sincere. Because there are people that know Scripture really well and can quote it left and right, but they do not have a sincere faith. Jesus was very much against this, even in his own time. Who knew the Scriptures well, better than anybody else? It was the Jewish leadership, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And who did he have the most confrontation with? Pharisees and Sadducees. And it wasn't... It wasn't because they didn't know the faith. Their faith was not sincere. They had turned what God had given them the authority to do into something that gave them power over other people. So he's questioning their sincerity. So if we gird our loins with the truth, that means that we have to know God's word as truth, and that's the base. That's what's underneath all the rest of our armor. Without that truth, the rest of it pretty much falls apart. 
So the first piece he talks about after that is the breastplate of righteousness. And why do we have righteousness as the breastplate? Because that's what's going to protect our heart, folks. He's talking about the righteousness and holiness and beauty and truth and mercy of God. And that's what protects our heart. It should protect our love of God, and most of all protect our love for fellow man. He then says, shod your feet with the gospel of peace. I think it's interesting that he used shoes or sandals in their time to talk about the gospel of peace because that implies you're going to walk around with it. Not only do you live the gospel of peace, not only do you accept the gospel of peace, it means it's supposed to go with you everywhere, you, every step you take. Kind of like that song from the police, every step you take, I'll be watching you. But the other interesting piece that I saw one of the commentators talk about it in their time, the, the sandals, and, and especially like Roman soldiers, they would not only just have sandals, but they kind of wrap their feet in leather and kind of up their legs a little bit. That when he's talking about the shotting of the feet, he's talking about not just what covers the feet, but also those shin, what we would call shin guards. I don't know what they called them back then. But, but those protect, protect them from traps and snares that enemies would set down low. Do you remember from last week where when I talked about and Adam, when he talked to Eve, what was going to happen when he put enmity between the snake and Eve? Where was Satan going to be able to get us? He's going to nip at our heels. Got a good pair of shoes on, we can good pair of snake boots on, we can avoid that, right? Satan's going to put traps and snares all along our faith journey. And knowing that he's going to nip at our feet, we need to have the gospel wrapped around us. The gospel of peace means that we should have a resolved frame of heart to walk and live our life by the gospel of Jesus Christ. To live at peace with one another. Be willing to repent of your sins. Be willing to ask forgiveness from people and be willing to forgive others. Because we worship a God that has already forgiven us. The next piece is the shield of faith. We already say, well, we've already got the breastplate of righteousness, but that shield of faith can, can guard the rest of us from everything. And the breastplate, what if, what if somebody comes from the side? If You've got to have a shield, right? You can move that shield wherever you want to go. It guards the whole person from the devil's assaults. It's, and it says, particularly, the shield of faith guards against the flaming arrows of Satan. Now, most arrows, if you, if you ever watched any of those old films when when there's an army advancing, they'll tell the archers in the back. When they take aim, they don't shoot right at them. They up in the air. And a breastplate up here protecting isn't going to be doing a whole lot of good, even a helmet, because they could get you in here. I mean, when they're coming down from the top. But if you've ever seen some of those films where the Romans, they form this thing, they used to call it the turtle, where the commander would give the command and all these guys just stand around the sides and they put up their shields and then guys put their shields up on top and it was like the, it was like the early version of a tank. Man, they could walk right through and then they put their spears out through from the in-between. They could walk over anybody with those things. So that shield of faith guards us from those flaming arrows wherever they may come from. We're talking about flaming arrows like temptation and deceit and intimidation and fear. It also helps us guard ourselves from the wickedness of the world. He tells you to put on the helmet of salvation. And that helmet of salvation is the knowledge that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. And it should guide our mind and our thoughts. Because if we keep it, if we keep salvation in the forefront of our mind, it keeps the hope of Christ's redemption. It maintains and protects our trust in the Lord. And he does give us an offensive weapon. It's called the sword of the Spirit. He also calls it the Word of God. The Word of God is what we fight directly against Satan's lies with. It goes all the way back to the, the truth. Because Jesus, think, think about this, when, when Satan, Satan isn't afraid to attack anybody. He's not even afraid to attack the Son of God. Remember when he did that in the wilderness? Three times he tempted him out in the wilderness. Throw yourselves from these rocks, give yourselves to me, turn this turn these rocks into bread. How did Jesus defend himself? 
He quoted the word of God right back at Satan. It's probably the most powerful weapon we've got, folks. The word of God against Satan's wiles in this world. And I like the fact that he uses the sword because you think of sword as slaying the enemy. The sword slays the temptations that sin brings. And even if you go all the way to the end of the book, when Jesus comes, it says when he speaks, his mouth, what comes out of his mouth is like a two-edged sword. It will convict and condemn. The last piece of this that might not be as obvious is he, he, says, he ends this whole piece of the full armor of God by saying, and pray always. And like one commentator said, that think of prayer as the buckle that puts all this together. But I don't know about you, I don't have a breastplate of righteousness sitting around and a helmet of salvation sitting around. I need to ask God to give me those things, right? To ask God, you have to pray. That's the most... Well, any conversation with God is really a prayer. Sometimes it might be a complaining prayer. <laughs> Sometimes it might be a praising prayer. Sometimes it might be a cry for help. But prayer is what pulls us all together and buckles it all together and holds the armor around us. Think of prayer as our call or our cry to God to come to our defense, to put on that armor of His. Prayer is something that we are in constant need of. In other words, there's no time that we shouldn't pray. And say, well, they tell me I can't pray. Okay, does that mean you're going to stop? Maybe they don't have to hear you pray. But you can still pray. I know of an instance where I was in, in uh, when I was a, a hospice chaplain. And I had one lady, I've told you the story before, but I had one lady ask her if I could pray for her, and she goes, no, I don't want you to pray for me. Okay. And I walked out of the room, but I stopped, and I prayed for her anyway. Prayed for her salvation. She was going through a horrific disease that she didn't want anybody to see, and her way of reconciling that was to tell people, just be away from me. So she was mean and nasty to everybody she came in contact with, and even throw stuff at the nurses and doctors. She ended up dying alone in her hospital bed because she just didn't want to see people, see, have people see her that way. I prayed for her anyway. She's not going to stop me from praying. They might be able to stop me from verbalizing it. They could cut out my tongue or sew my mouth shut. I could pray up here. Right? So pray everywhere, anytime, and anywhere. So in the last two weeks, I've given you the nature of spiritual warfare. and Most good, godly Christian people know it's out there. Some people don't want to know it's out there, but it's there, folks. Just take a look at our world. It, it manifests itself through human beings and through organizations and through governments sometimes, through diseases. But it's there. I mean, we can battle those things, but that's like, it, it, it's kind of like when you're treating a symptom and not going after the cause of the disease. If you want to fight spiritual warfare, then you need to resist the devil and pray against his work in this world. When we start praying against each other and praying against each other's, I don't know, whatever you want to say, cause, we're just feeding in, we're, as Cindy would like to say, we're feeding the monster. Because his goal was to get us to turn against one another. There's a show on TV I've been watching for quite a while, I've been watching for the last month or so, and the most insidious enemy that they have is this group of people that can kind of change their shape. It's, it's, it's a sci-fi thing, but it's a Star Trek. <laughs> but the way they take down their enemies is they go in and they disguise themselves. They, there's creatures called changelings. They can make themselves look like anything. They can look like, a, look like a table if they want to. But they can make themselves look like anybody. So what they do is they send one or two people into these races of people, and they get, they get these races of people, these different groups, to fight against each other. They go in there, they plant the seed, and then they leave. So when they come out, they don't have to do much of the work because, and, it, and they even said that in this, one of this, these last episodes. They said, there's only one of us here, but look at the havoc we've created. 
and he'll never catch us, and then whoosh, disappears. That's how Satan loves to work. He likes to drop into a church, cause a little trouble, and then sit back and say, watch them destroy themselves. Then he'll pick maybe a, a social issue and say, well, let's get one side over here, one side over here, let's get them to fight in the street, and let's get media all fired up about it. He won't have to do much work because we're doing a good job of destroying ourselves. We have to realize that it's not against each other that we're fighting, it's against Satan. The spiritual battle before us is to fight against those distractions that this world's going to throw at us, and there's a lot of them this year. 2020 is the worst year I've ever seen in my life. But we know these are just distractions to try to get us from the true thing, and that's hearing the word of God and taking it to people out in the world. Because Satan wants us to lose hope. He wants us to fear, fill in the blank, whatever it is for this month. <laughs> right? Because Satan wants us to take our eyes off Jesus. It doesn't mean that we run away and we hide in a cave and turn our back to the world or bury ourselves in our religion. But it does mean that no matter what we do, we need to focus our hearts, minds, soul, and all our strength on Jesus Christ and take our faith and apply it to what we know and go out in the world loving God and loving others. Because our love of God and our faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior should be the center from which everything else comes out of us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for these beautiful words from Scripture, the way that you... Lord, it doesn't seem like there's a situation out there that you don't have some advice, some instruction for us. And Lord, as the spiritual battle wages and, and rages, and it just seems it's, taking, it's tearing nations apart. It's put, putting nations against nation, neighbor against neighbor, and even churchgoer against churchgoer in some instances, Lord. And Lord, I, I want to pray against those spirits and principalities of division and disruption and those powers that try to instill evil in the hearts of men and women to do things to each other. Lord, I just pray against his influence in this world and, and pray that your Holy Spirit would come and revive our country, revive our nation, revive our world. Lord, we need you in this world desperately and we ask for your help. We ask that as you continue to teach and lead us in spiritual warfare, Lord, that we would always stand behind our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and use the gospel as our sword of truth. Lord, I pray that as we go from this place that people would know we are Christians by our love, and that love would conquer all. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Spring will come 
Now, brothers and sisters, go out in the full armor of God, knowing that Lord is your salvation. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.